everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you for all showing up. Apparently, we had to get more seats to fit people into this room, and I really appreciate you coming to listen to me talk about resources and definitions and my own personal fear of them. So, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Simply Measure, and when I'm doing that information janitor work, I'm I'm trying to keep the series of tubes that we have in the measure flowing. In, in particular, I'm trying to keep, keep the business value flowing. And I'm sure you guys are the same. Uh, but <coughs> what business value? What, why am I doing this? Because I want to increase revenue. I want to decrease expenses. I want to increase perceived value and, and throughput and remove latency and availability problems from my system. But, but those are those are goals, right? Those aren't, you can't do any of those. What you can do is you can reduce waiting, you can re reduce non-utilization, all of these forms of waste that go into your system that pre prevent you from making the change that you need to do to achieve business value. Well, how do you do that? You do that through change. But what are we changing? Well, let me take a step back. In order to describe change, you have to describe where you are in the first place. And so let's use this little box to represent your infrastructure. And this is your brain. And you'll notice that the metaphor of a square peg and a round hole seems to apply. It's very hard to get all of that infrastructure information into your head. And why is that? Well, there's a theory from the 1930s called linguistic relativism. The idea being that uh, your linguistic tools are proportional to the cognitive actions that you can take on those linguistic tools. What is that? That means that the power of your language is directly correspondent to the power of your thoughts about those ideas in the language. So, if we want to change the information about your infrastructure, you need to change your ideas about your infrastructure, which means that you need to change the words about your infrastructure, which means that we need to develop a language for your business to develop your business value, to make that change rapidly. Otherwise, you're going to spend all your time just trying to get the ideas into your own head. Okay, that's high level and delightful, and we have the tools. We have the ability to create this new language using regular recipes, definitions, lightweight resource providers, and heavyweight ones. But just because those tools exist doesn't mean that when you're in a corner, when push comes to shove, that you're going to be able to use them. So we need to get you to be able to trust these tools so when you're in desperate times, you can use them. So, let me tell you a story. You are one of the core founders at a startup, and you have a minimum viable product. You have one app, you have one service, and describing that service, you have one recipe. And this is your recipe. Now, don't worry, it's six point font, so you're not expected to be able to read this, but it does more or less what you expect. Up the top, it installs some basic dependencies, creates a user and a group, it drops some templates and deploys your code and then finally starts your service. It's everything you need for your basic application. You take my word for it, that's what that cookbook does. And because you've written an excellent configuration for this service, your minimum viable product has become very viable. You guys are growing. So now you discover that you need a second app. You need something to do maybe some background processing or to do big data processing, or send emails, or something. So you need a second service. And to manage that second service, you create a second recipe. Voila, a second recipe. <laughs> Notice how similar they look. Yes, I know, it's, it's tiny, but I promise, they're, they're very similar. In fact, I ran it through diff, and those yellow lines are the ones that have anything different on them, and a bright blue on it, that's the only stuff that's different, because you just got two nearly identical Ruby apps. They work the same, right? 
almost everything you want about them is going to be the same, except for maybe the repo and the app name. But yeah. as you go along, you notice that some changes get into <coughs> one cookbook, but not into the other cookbook. Or maybe you're excellent and you never have any of those divergent problems, but you do have to spend a lot of time keeping those code bases up to date. Well, what do you do about that? Well, if you're a regular software engineer, I think I should dry up my code, because I don't want to repeat myself. But as a pragmatic systems engineer, or a system thing, I know that this is not really an end in and of itself. So I'm not going to encourage you to always don't repeat yourself. But when it causes problems, I want you to not wreck yourself. Whenever possible, find these things that are causing your pain and ameliorate the pain. So what we're going to do here is we're going to remove the repetition that is causing us pain. It's causing divergence. So how do we do this? We're starting with a cookbook. We want to get all that common stuff out. Well, we have a tool called the definition. Webster's defines the definition as a statement conveying fundamental character. That is an entirely useless definition for our use. <laughs> so what is the definition that we're going to try and do? Well, this is a minimal Ruby de definition. It has a name, it has a set of parameters, and you can access those parameters from inside the block by accessing the parameters hash. Very straightforward. How do we use it? Well, what I've done is I have gone through our original cookbook and I've identified all the places where we were calling different things in the different cookbooks. That's where it's blue. I've pushed it up to the top into a parens hash. This parens hash represents the uh, parens that we're passing into the definition that we want to get to. So by taking all of the differences and pulling them up, up to the top and sticking them in one variable, we now have all of our cookbooks looking identical from here on. With this duplication identified and being exactly duplicate, we can move on and copy and paste this stuff straight into a definition. Now, I know there will be some people who say, oh, you should never use definitions. And I'm not going to disagree with them, but when you're trying to move forward, sometimes being able to copy and paste is better than nothing. So, to do this, you just copy and paste. And if you meet any predefined defaults, you can pass them up in your definitions block of parameters. Otherwise, this internal bit is exactly the same as from your cookbook. So, having extracted all of this into a definition, we can replace this much larger cookbook with this cookbook. This is, I'm sorry, recipe. This is an entire recipe calling our Ruby app deploy definition. And as you can see, you can actually semantically see what the recipe is intending to do. But, of course, we've now all got these brands up at the top and then we're just accessing them a bit later. Well, when you're refactoring, you want to do it in as small a chunks as possible. So this is what you would actually do. But your end goal is to get here is to have something extremely semantic that just describes what your infrastructure means to you. So you've inlined all of these parameters and they're meaningful for you. Now, I'm not going to discuss how you get these values, service discovery or search or anything else is an entirely different topic that could take at least as long as this talk. But assuming you can get all of these values, this can describe your current Ruby app. All right. So what have we done? We've gone from this, multiple versions of this, to this, a single tiny little block, which, to look at it again, actually conveys the meaning in your infrastructure. Now, what are the advantages of using a definition? It does allow you to avoid repetition. It, it's very good for that. But the main advantage over the alternatives is that it's copy and paste. So when you're in a crunch and you just need to get it done, it can be a solution for you. The disadvantage is it adds another layer of abstraction. 
it requires you to go look in another place. So if you only have one application, it obviously doesn't make sense to abstract all of this stuff out. Because then anytime you need to read your one cookbook, you're going to have to read another definition and keep all that safe in your head, which you don't want to do. So what else could we use this for besides speaking about application flows? Well, one thing that we do use it for is for a storage map because we've got a number of the same operations that we use every time we create a directory, we make sure that it's got the right owners, right permissions, then attach a mount to it and symlink it into a final access directory. Because we do those things with all of our storage mounts, a definition is perfect. It's really simple, really easy to understand. And for lightweight things, don't have a lot of interaction with the rest of your system, it can be perfect. Now, I'd like to take a moment right now to talk about how I got stuck. For years, I was stuck with definitions because I was afraid of understanding heavyweight resource providers because I, when I got started, there weren't lightweight resource providers. And then when lightweight resource providers came out, I wasn't really sure I understood the notification stuff. I wasn't sure I understood all the semantics involved. And it seemed like I had to learn a lot just to be able to use anything basic with either kind of provider. And that, that hung me up. So I'd like to get you past that as well. So in our company, we're still growing. We've got our two apps, our two services today, but we've made a, uh, a bit of progress and we found product market fit, so now we've got three apps. And this third app, this third app's a little different. It happens to have some feature flags, and, and those change quite a bit more often than the rest of our deploy. But we don't have any way of, of notifying the deploy that it needs to reload this configuration every time it changes. The reason we don't have that is because definitions don't allow you to subscribe or receive notifications. This is a bit of a problem. Now, there are ways to work around it, but they kind of stink. So if you want your deploy to act like a first-class citizen in Chef, you've got to move beyond definitions. You've got to move into resources and providers. So we're going to start with lightweight resource providers. We're starting there because they take less code to write, and they can be easier to reason about. But there are certain advantages to heavyweight resource providers that we'll get to later. So Webster's defines a resource as an asset that can be drawn on in order to function effectively. And that's not a terrible definition, but for our resource, uh, for our use, this is more useful. This is a minimal lightweight resource, and this is a minimal lightweight provider. It does almost nothing. It takes one attribute, and it creates one file in town. It doesn't even stick anything in the file. Okay, so you can you can look at this, and you can hack around it. But how do we adapt our app deploy to actually take advantage of these notifications of, of all the features that lightweight resource providers give us? Well, we take this deploy, uh, the, this deploy definition, and much like the last time, we take all of the parameters and we pull them together up into a resource object at the top of the file. Now, I'm using an open struct, which allows us to represent the resource using something ad hoc. But eventually, we're going to replace all of these calls to, to new resource, which are an open struct here, with an actual chef resource. But this lets the, the rest of our definition look exactly like an action would in a lightweight resource provider. So when you refactor all of your calls to params to new, uh, new resource dot <coughs> attribute, then this stuff, it works exactly like uh, the action. So what you're going to be doing here, once you've got it set up like that, you take all of this Ostruct business and you turn it into attributes in your resource. I'm getting a little befuddled. 
Uh, okay, so you've got your resource, and your resource has all of these attributes. And you get something for free that you didn't have with the definition, and you get validation. So in this case, we've got names which need to be strings, and, and repos which need to be strings, but you can also add the ability to match a regular expression. You can do all sorts of validations if you need to. And that's something that you didn't get with a definition unless you built it in by hand. So having extracted the resource part and refactored all of the definition to use that new resource object, you can now copy the rest of your uh, definition into an action, in this case, a create action for your provider. Now, once you do that, you won't see a whole lot of advantages. <clears throat> but you will see that you can notify it. And if you need to add another action, like a reload action, which would just be calling uh, a touch to temp restart, if you were doing that, you could easily do that in a single, uh, in a few lines down at the bottom. And this gives you all the power of a first class resource that you didn't have with the definition. So what does that mean? All of these advantages come from being a resource. You get notifications, you get validation, you get first class error handling, and you get multiple actions, which is important because most resources you'll discover end up looking very similar to core chef resources. Usually they'll look like a file or a template or a package, or they'll look like an execute or a service. Most of the time, if you're creating a resource, you, you want your resource to resemble one of those packages as much as possible, or one of those resources as much as possible, and the same kind of actions and the kind, same kind of semantics. There is a problem, though. It requires more files. You've got to have a file in your provider's directory and in your resources directory. And they've got to match, and they've got to have a name that matches the cookbook that you're in. <coughs> now, there are some ways around this, but in general, you don't want to use them. So it, it can be annoying to have that additional abstraction overhead in your head. But what's worse is it is a totally different syntax. You can't just copy and paste from the cookbook that was working yesterday and turn it into a resource today. You've got to go through a significant refactoring process. But once you do that, you can start getting real gains because you can have resources that really describe things that exist in your company. You can have vhosts that represent actual applications. You can have users that represent all of the things that you really require for users to be set up in your, your infrastructure. You can drop uh, a scale, it can attach them to LDAP, it can make sure that they've got an NFS mount. It can take care of all of those things for you. And if you need to remove them, you can simply add an action to do that for you, which you can't do with a definition. Okay, so we discussed definitions and lightweight resource providers, and most people will only go this far. But there are some circumstances where you need more. Your company, your company's been doing great. It's, it's succeeding beyond your wildest expectations. And even though you love Ruby and you want it to work, you've discovered that now you have to have multiple different stacks. And so your deployment methodology that worked great for Ruby apps, it doesn't work anymore. So you've got a lot of these deployment concepts that apply both to the, way this, they, the ways that you want to deploy your Java apps, as well as the ways that you want to deploy your Ruby apps, but there are some core components that need to differ. How do you deal with this? Well, the best way is a heavyweight resource provider. And Webster's defines a heavyweight as a leader in one's field, which if you actually can use these effectively, you will be a leader in the field of chef. So what does that look like for us? This is roughly a minimal resource and provider in heavyweight style. And you'll notice that for a minimal 
piece of code, it sure got a lot of code to it. This is why we call them heavyweights. Now, when we're trying to adapt our application deploy to this heavyweight model, we're going to have a lot more code to do what seems like exactly the same thing. So let's, let's go through each of the different components in the resource side. The first is our init uh, initialization method. Now, uh, in it, you always get a name attribute, and you can set internal instance variables. These are uh, possibly exposed as attributes on your resource. And then you also get an action. Uh, oop, that particular line is wrong. Uh, your allowed actions, uh, you can push all of the available ones. And you can also set your current action, uh, your default action, to what it should be by default. Uh, this looks very similar to um, an lightweight resource provider, where you merely say actions create reload, and the first one is by default the default. That's what this part does. And the rest of this is handled uh, invisibly for lightweight resource providers. Now, once you've got your initialization method set up, you then need to go on to your attributes. Now, all the attributes that you want to act like they would in a lightweight resource provider, you're going to have it take a single value, which is defaults to nil, and then have set or return in here calling uh, the instance variable that you want to set to it and the validations that you want. Now, it's entirely possible that the attribute syntax is going to be pushed down into heavyweight resource providers in the near future. Uh, but at the moment, this is what's required. And this is internally what's happening when you call attribute in a lightweight resource provider. So that, those are the two things that you've got to do to modify your uh, lightweight resource into a heavyweight resource. Now let's talk about what you're doing with your provider. Fortunately, modifying providers is much simpler. The first thing that you've got to do, you've got to do, is load, load the current resource. And to load your current resource, you don't actually have to do anything. You can have an empty method if you want. But I strongly encourage you to actually have identity resources. And in order to do that, you're going to want to have a knowledge of what the current resource is and how it differs from the resource that you're trying to achieve. So you'll do that by creating a new resource, for example, a Ruby app deploy, based on your new resource. And you're going to further set values by checking, say, the file system or running processes. And make sure that that current resource reflects what's going on on the machine. Then, instead of using the action shorthand for your, your actions, you're just going to stick action underscore in front of it and make it a method, because that's all that's happening inside your lightweight resource provider anyway. Now, because you've got a current resource in your heavyweight resource provider, you can have some of your operations depend on what the values of that current, weight, uh, current resource are. And that can be useful when you're reading other people's heavyweight resource providers, trying to get ideas for how to make yours better. All right, so ultimately, when, once we've gone through the full conversion process for a heavyweight resource provider, we end up with these two classes. These are more or less identical to the lightweight resource provider that we were looking at earlier. Now, you're probably looking at this and seeing that I've gotten back to an entirely unreadable font and wondering why on earth would you be doing this? Well, the reason is some of this you're probably going to want to extract. This deploy section here, you may be doing that in a totally different way in a different kind of application deploy. But you can abstract each of these common parts because this is just a class and you can have descendants of this class. You can have subclasses. You can have mix ends because it's just Ruby at this point. All right. 
So, why, why are we using heavyweight resource providers? Mostly because they're Ruby. Because anything you can do in Ruby, you can do in heavyweight resource provider. No worries. It just acts like Ruby. And it does make it much easier to do subclassing. You can pretend to do it with lightweight resources, but I don't recommend it. And it also gives you the opportunity to have multiple providers attached to the same uh, resource. So in our initialization method in our resource, we can override which provider we're passing ourselves off to. This is especially useful if you're doing something like a package resource, which on one system may be using one provider, and on another system may be using something different. If you happen to have, say, a user system where it requires you to interact with a remote server like LDAP, and you want to also be able to use this on your local machines, you could have that resource decide, depending on whether it's a local environment or a production environment, whether it should actually connect to the LDAP server or if it should just stick a stud user in. So what's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is it's all Ruby, and it's not really coming out to help you. So, when are you going to want to do this? You're going to want to do this, first of all, when you start having resources which resemble each other quite a bit. When you start having three different resources that have mostly copied and pasted code, a little bit of differences inside them, subclassing will be your friend. Otherwise, you're going to get into that same divergence scenario that you had all the way at the beginning with your copied and pasted recipes. So here are some of the things that you are definitely going to experience if you go long enough building your own infrastructure in Chef. You're going to have things that look like services, that look like packages, that look like plugins. And in different environments, they're going to share quite a bit of code but work a little bit differently. I'd also like to send a shout out to a library called Poise. Poise is one of the things that has caused me to be less afraid of heavyweight resource providers and to go out and see how much I can do with resources, even when I, I may as well just copy and paste into a definition. Poise gives you many of the DSL advantages that a lightweight resource provider has, but gives them to you in a heavyweight resource provider's form. By taking advantage of the magic which is Ruby, it allows those to be much easier to read. And if you have any questions, there was a talk on it yesterday that you should definitely watch. All right, so we discussed definitions. We discussed lightweight resource providers and we discussed heavyweight resource providers. But the thing is, you're using these to solve problems for your business. And you're trying to create solutions, repeatable solutions for your business. And only you can understand what really need to go into those solutions, what ideas have to be wrapped up in them. And so you're all writing your infrastructure as code. You can do this. But somebody has to understand it, right? Like if you get hit by a bus, somebody's going to have to figure out what all of this stuff means. And if you build that knowledge into a language, then you can build it into the code and you can keep it going. You have definitions, we have lightweight resources and we have lightweight providers. And you know the differences now. You know how to go from one to the other, how to weigh them. So don't be afraid. Don't be like I was. And when you need these tools, crack them open, use them. Because if you build a higher level language, you can find higher level ideas and ultimately solve higher level problems and repeat and succeed. I'm Joseph Olson from Simply Measured. As many other people have said, hiring. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've got any questions? I'd love to answer them. Um, for the heavyweight providers, do uh, the classes still live in file in the, the resources and provider directory? No, 
They live in the library's directory. Uh, the heavyweight resource pro providers do not go in the uh, resources and providers directories just because they are, they're named that. It's not mean that they go there. Um, they go with all of the rest of your pure Ruby code in your library's directory. Okay, questions? Back. You talked about uh, how to make a. Thank you. You talked about how to make a heavyweight resource provider understand when it's been changed by loading the previous state at the beginning. Uh, how do you do the same thing in a lightweight resource provider, or do you need not need to? Uh, you can same way. Uh, the the thing is, a lot of the time when you're doing a lightweight resource provider, you're just going for something quick and dirty. Um, to implement a load current resource method is perfectly valid in lightweight resource providers, and it works just the same. You then get a current resource instance variable that contains all your state once you set it up. Which is to say, uh, how do you do it? Well, you do it the same. Can you mix lightweight and heavyweight resources with providers? Can you mix heavyweight and lightweight resource providers? Yes, you can. Uh, ultimately, they're just classes. The lightweight is a shorthand syntax for creating those classes. But the lookup procedure is identical. So if you create a, a lightweight resource and stick the heavyweight resource in libraries, but it have, you have the appropriate name, just going to find it, and vice versa. Uh, variable scoping. Thank you. Could you repeat the question, question, please? Uh, do I have any tips and tricks for variable scoping in resource providers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, treat it like Ruby, know what your state is, and yeah, as much of your state should be in the resource as possible. Um, your provider should just be implementing command patterns operating on the state in your current and new resources. Any other hands? Yes? Yes. Um, dependencies in resources. For example, if a resource re realizes that it will re require something else like R, for example, which we have a completely different recipe to install, can you do that? You can, but I don't recommend it. And I'm not sure I can tell you why. I, I've internalized this ages ago. But I'm not sure I, I remember exactly why you shouldn't do that. But I noticed that it seems like almost no one does. So Mia is saying that it's basically very hard to look into that context um, because you're doing an include recipe from inside your heavyweight resource provider. And yeah, basically, it's it gets tricky. It can confuse Chef. Uh, whenever possible, resources should deal only with resources, and recipes should be the ones calling other recipes that don't go backwards. Yes. What's the difference between using um, a definition, which I've never done before, um, and <clears throat> creating a, a cookbook like Ruby App and defining all those? Um, di things that differentiate app A and app B in attributes? Uh, effectively nothing. Okay. Um, the thing about a definition is you can call it multiple times with different parameters, whereas you can't have multiple sets of attributes in the same space. Now, if you wanted to have, no, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat his question. Uh, what's the difference between a definition and merely having a reusable cookbook where you set the attribute va variables to the parameters that you want and have that cookbook work on those attribute variables. Well, 
with a definition, you can call it multiple times with different parameters. Because attribute, node attributes are global, you can't. You, you can change them and then call it again, but then they're not going to be persisted after store, and so you're going to be very confused when you get to the end of your run, and a lot of things have happened, presumably, on node attributes that have then changed. So one thing about definitions is if you've got more of a programming background, the best way to think about a definition is think of it as a macro. It's not a class. It's not a first class function. It just pretends to be a call out to another thing while containing most of the same scoping. Any other questions? Shoot. Testing HWRPs. Well, I'm not the best person to speak about this because I do most of my testing integration style. And testing heavyweight resource providers, lightweight resource providers, and definitions is the same if you're just running Test Kitchen and a BATS test. But there's a few people in this room who do do unit testing with heavyweight resource providers. And I know that it is much easier with a heavyweight resource provider because it's just a class than it is when you've got to run things through the LWRP DSL or when you're doing a definition. That's because you can isolate the scope that it's in. You can stub out things that you don't want it having access to. You can create a nice isolated container. Personally, I don't work with custom resources enough to have a lot of experience with that. I, I just do it for the business use case, and pulling out all the unit testing is not something I've experienced with. Yeah. There's a lot of examples of that in the shop. Uh, so that's, good. that's a good point. All of the internal shop resource providers are, you know, heavyweight resource providers, and they all have stacks. Yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> it's Maya, right? Yeah. Maya. Um, Maya's just reminding us that the chef source code has all all of its resources and providers are heavyweight, and they've got a lot of testing. So if you want to know some good examples for that, they're there. One last question. Shoot. That sounds useful. I'm not entirely sure how I would make that magic happen. Uh, I would love to meet up with you afterwards and, and try and figure out how to make that work. <laughs> Poise has a thing for lots of things. It's all right. Thanks.